Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. <laughs> My name is Christina Ishmael. I am one of the team members of Open Ed Global, the Director of Primary and Secondary Education. I'm thrilled to be joined by Jan and Jenrin this morning for their workshop. And I have nothing else to say, so I'm gonna let them take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, lovely. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, good morning slash afternoon slash evening slash night. Um, <laughs> yeah, folks from all around the world. Uh, last week we we had a session where there is there were folks from from Alberta to uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe, you know, from A to Z. So um, <laughs> this is awesome about these uh, about these conferences. Folks from all over the world can show up, and uh, it's it's absolutely awesome. Uh, we're thrilled to be here uh, with Jenrin, and uh, we have been having discussions about uh, about open open uh, education and open government for uh, for a long time. And this has become like a special year for, uh, for uh, open government partnership. And some of you may be, uh, may be aware uh, of what, uh, what, what OGP is. Uh, but before we, be, before we go there, uh, we see someone, hi, greetings from Chile and, um, and Tacoma, Washington. And uh, uh, would, you, would you say hello in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the chat box and, and just, and just uh, say hello so that, so that uh, we know where you're from? We'll have like a round of, 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 of introductions and uh, we'll be able to, to share a little more. Uh, today, we'll, uh, this, uh, this workshop will be, uh, will be uh, kind of like uh, cut in two parts. Uh, the first one is, um, is kind of like a general introduction and uh, what open government uh, partnership is and, uh, and kind of like an introduction to what, what we'll be doing here. And the second one uh, will, be, will be interaction, just, uh, just talking about, uh, about various ways to, to get involved, what resources are available, uh, and uh, how, to, how to get involved uh, in this work. The first part is being recorded, so, so uh, just, just, these, uh, just the introduction of the topic will be, will be on the record if someone, someone isn't able to, to attend right now, uh, but, would like to, but would like to jump in a little later. And, and the second part where we, where we discuss that will, that, will be, uh, that will be off the record, that there will be the Las Vegas rule, uh, what what is what is shared here stays here, so um, so yeah for the first part, uh, there's been a lot uh, of discussions about about what, what what COVID has done this year and um, uh, right right now I'm in Slovakia that, that's where I live and schools are currently shut down uh, in many countries including here, and uh, plus today is national holiday but overall you know schools are you know, schools are shut down, um, and it's super useful to have quality open uh, digital resources and. Um, you know, my, my colleague's daughter, she's studying for final exams in, in her high school, and uh, she suddenly lost access to the library uh, because, you know, there were limitations. Uh, it's not like a full lockdown, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot harder to, to, to get these things. And so she lost access to the library. She lost access uh, to the books. And, uh, you know, having, having meaningful access to, to, uh, to the resources is really, really cool. And also there's a, a local specialty here. A lot of the resources that, that uh, are available to, to the students like textbooks and, 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 and workbooks, on, workbooks on all kinds of digital resources, uh, they were created uh, with, with public funds, with public money. So uh, basically the government procured like the creation of you know, third grade history textbooks, that sort of thing. So uh, the creation itself was, uh, was, was paid for uh, by, uh, by, the, by the government or government agencies. Um, but still those, a lot of those resources that were created with public money uh, are just, just aren't available. And uh, it's, that's because of, of the way that, uh, that the contracts with the publishers have been set up uh, historically. Uh, didn't have that much sense uh, in, in the pre-internet era, but, but, but now there's a lot of sense, but there's still this inertia, I you know, like the old way to, to do the contracts is still here. And um, so it's kind of like a legacy uh, that, that, that we're carrying. And we need to change the default. So when someone uh, pays for, uh, for, for things like that with, with public money, um, or, or co it's, it's being co-financed by, by public money, uh, those research, resources should be, should be openly available. Um, and there's a lot of ways to, uh, to achieve changing the default. Uh, to, you know, there are a lot, a lot of different ways to change the policy. And uh, one of them is uh, through the open government partnership uh, channels. Um, generally, we'll, we'll uh, explain in, in, in much more detail how open government partnership works. Uh, but what we wanted to, to share is that um, OGP has been traditionally 
working on these policies uh, on the government level, like national government level. And there are a lot of, a lot of things are happening uh, on, on, uh, on that level. Like in the US, it'd be, it'd be like the federal, uh, federal level. But there's a lot, a lot of things that are happening below the federal level in the US, like state level, uh, municipalities. There's a lot of policies being adopted uh, on, on all kinds of, uh, you know, in all kinds of areas. And um, so, so Open Government Partnership, the organization has been expanding to, to not only function on the level of the national governments, but also, also on the levels of cities and, uh, and, and, and regions. And uh, that's been a very exciting development. And this year, uh, OGP has, has included 56 uh, new, new members, new cities. So there's a very major expansion. Um, and, uh, and this is a really good time to, to, to introduce open education to, uh, to, to these areas. And um, I've been talking for way too long, so so Jenna will uh, will will introduce uh, will will introduce those things now. And um, yeah, would you would you jump in, Jenna, and, and and explain what what OGP is all about and and how it works and things like that? Sure, sure. And feel free to jump in if there's anything I'm missing. Also, I see um, Jonathan Porritz just joined us. So hey, Jonathan, feel free to also jump in if there's anything that. Um, <laughs> that I'm missing here as well. I know um, he was in the last session. Hey. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with OGP, here's a, a really quick kind of 101. And this is this is our perspective as two kind of ex-government officials that used to work in um, on OGP commitments in our respective governments. So um, we're particularly biased toward the OGP, and I will just say that right here and right now. Um, so the Open Government Partnership, uh, it's a really interesting pact among civil society members and government counterparts around the world. It was started under the Obama administration in the US. Um, President Obama at the time worked with seven other countries to, um, to create this, this kind of, this, partnership with civil society to promote transparency and governance. So um, we wanted to look at how to, um, how to foster more accountability, how to foster more responsiveness and increase services for citizens and so on. And since its origins with those eight countries total, including the US, um, the OGP has really grown and changed. It's, it's pretty amazing to see over time um, how how much more it's expanded and, and included under its purview. So um, now there are 79 national governments involved in this pact or this partnership around the world, which represent about 2 billion people, which is pretty substantial. Together, OGP governments and civil society members create these two-year national action plans. So this is a set of commitments that the government officials are responsible for implementing that are then overseen by a third party, um, a civil society um, kind of third party that makes sure the governments are sort of held accountable to the commitments that they made. Um, and these commitments can range um, and take a number of different forms. So we've seen commitments range from um, open governance issues around fiscal transparency and accountability to, um, to access to data, to education, and so on. There are really a number of different commitments that emerge from this dialogue between civil society members and organizations and their government counterparts. And what's really important to note is that there are government counterparts that you can access yourself. You can find their contact information on the OGP website, which is not just true for the national level OGP plan, but now also for the, the local um, plan as well. So this has been a really important avenue for us to, um, to work with in open education. We've found that um, the OGP has been a, a really tremendous vehicle for enacting some of the policies that we need to support all of the really wonderful grassroots efforts that are going on around the world already. So we know, obviously, at you know, the Open Education Global Conference at other conferences and through our other um, our other engagements that there are so many 
really powerful advocates and so many local efforts that need support that may be doing incredible things on their own, but that might be even um, that might reach even more audiences or have even more impact with a little bit more sort of buttressing or support from top down policy. So the way I think of it is um, we need obviously the will and the local efforts for substantial change, but um, we also need policies. We need the kind of extra support that um, validates a lot of this work um, that happens at the policy level. So I think of it as, as kind of like two, two parts that are ideally working together for lasting change in open education in particular. Um, and I'm happy to um, hear otherwise, but this, this seems to be a, a really um, a good avenue for, for work in this space. So the reason, as Jan mentioned, the reason that we are looking at um, the Open Government Partnership again now is because we are at a really um, pivotal moment in our, our kind of arc of work with the OGP and also open education. So initially, as Jan mentioned, OGP was only open to national government counterparts and civil society counterparts as well, but it worked at a national level. And now as we're seeing the locus of of accountability and of engagement with civil society in some places shifting to a more local level in the US. And for example, that is um, arguably the case. We see an increased opportunity for that work at the local level that we want to accomplish. Additionally, the OGP has, after a, a very recent pilot program, has just launched that OGP local program with 56 new cities joining the partnership, which is incredible. So these cities are all over the world. I know there are, um, we have a, a link that we can share later about the, the new cities and regions joining us, but this is, this is a really wonderful way to get more localized experts connected to those local uh, government representatives and able to consider what the local needs are and make commitments around them. The OGP local program is also pretty interesting because it affords potentially a little bit more flexibility than the OGP national level um, program. So I'll explain what I mean a little bit more. Um, and some of this, some of this was debated last last week. So feel free to um, to chime in if you think otherwise. But here's why I think this is a wonderful opportunity right now. First of all. As I mentioned, a lot of um, a lot of decision making, especially in education, gets made at the local um, levels of governance. So I know that's that's true in the U.S. I know that's true in a number of other countries around the world. Not all countries, but um, we have a particular area of um, of influence more at the local level than at the at the national level. Second, I I argue that it is easier to make. The case that is, it is easier to make a persuadable argument to politicians that education meets their needs, whatever their needs may be. So, education is arguably an issue that appeals to both parties or multiple parties, depending on where you're from. You just have to find the right angle to to make that case. Education can be a great kind of avenue for additional diplomatic discussions on other topics that are often more, um, more challenging or more partisan. Um, open education efforts also, um, they can help us achieve some of the other OGP goals that are so important to our government counterparts. So implementing and improving public services, working on issues of inclusion, focusing on open procurement, um, looking at open data, financial responsibility, and most recently, um, the OGP response to COVID. These are all really important goals to OGP that open education can, can further support. So the, the final thing that I'll mention, I, I expect that OGP local will offer us a little bit more flexibility than the OGP national plan with the commitment cycle and modes of engagement and so on. And what we're seeing so far is 
that yes, there are um, there is a, a Slack channel that's open to anyone. So you can have a direct contact with the director of OGP Local. You can um, you can engage in these commitment cycles that are rather than two year national action plans with a kind of strict timeline. You can engage in these local action plans that are anywhere between one and four years, depending on um, the local context and needs. And then there's no uh, population threshold for applications. So a lot of smaller localities are welcome to join. Um, and finally, I know OGP will be launching a, um, a collaborative hub for learning and supporting this kind of community of practice, which is yet another avenue for open education. So I think this is a particularly relevant time for us to get involved or re-involved with the OGP. And I'm excited to see what we can de develop today in our discussion. So we're, we're going to share some links with you. We're going to share some ways that you can get involved and, um, and drum up ideas for engagement with your local um, government representatives. But first, I want to actually pause as uh, I know a few more people have come in and just um, just see if folks want to put their videos on and unmute themselves and maybe share any questions that they might have um, before we kind of transition to some examples and some some more of the interactive parts of this session. And if you don't want to unmute your, your camera or microphone, that's OK, too. Feel free to post any questions or thoughts that you might have in the chat space. We're just delighted to have folks joining from all over. Small crowd, but yeah, we're, we've got good representation. Hey, Jonathan. I know it's it's pretty early in depending on your time zone. Here's a story I'd, I'd love to share if I may. Please. Um, this has been a really, really rough year for uh, for a lot of a lot of municipalities uh, in terms of, you know, having to manage a lot of the fallout from uh, from the COVID crisis. And um, my hometown, Bratislava, for example, did not apply to formally join uh, the OGP because of what's, what's been going on. Um, but I spoke with uh, with some of the leaders of uh, of of, of uh, the city uh, of the city, and uh, they they said, you know what? Uh, at this time, we are not applying to uh, to join the OGP local, but uh, we are definitely putting the OGP principles into what we are already doing. And this is something that, that you can do. Like uh, out of those 56 countries, uh, I mean, sorry, 56 um, sub-national governments that, uh, that uh, uh, will be joining, uh, joining the OGP local program, only one of them is the US. That's the city of Los Angeles. Okay, and, uh, but it doesn't mean that you, you should lose heart. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not for me. You know, there's, there's so many thousands and thousands of cities and, uh, and only uh, a few dozen uh, are, are currently part of OGP and maybe a few hundred will be uh, over, over time. Uh, but it's not my municipality. Uh, that's not for me, um, you know, so let me find something else. Uh, you can be kind of like a, a secret member or, or not really a member. You can just go ahead and apply those principles uh, of participation of, of uh, opening things up through, through policies, uh, uh, of, of transparency, of effective governance, you know, of, of visibility into what, what, what is uh, going on in the city government, uh, of partnership between, between uh, the, uh, the government and the civil society members. All of those can happen even without formal, formal uh, participation. So those things can can happen first. You can you can formally join OGP later, or maybe or maybe not. You know, maybe you can uh, you can do it uh, do it without it. So this is an opportunity for everyone who wants to uh, bring those pr principles of of openness of participation. Uh, you know, both both in terms of open content like open educational resources, open data, uh, opening things up in, in terms of what what is being produced uh, as, as as the digital resources, and in terms of participation like. Uh, open uh, educational, I mean, uh, open educational practices, uh, and also things like participatory, uh, participatory uh, budgeting, 
uh, and other ways of, 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 of getting involved. You know, so all of these principles can be, can be happening even if you are not part of, uh, part of the OGP, even if your, your local city government is not part of OGP. Uh, and that. also, yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot that, that uh, is, is happening, just, just like Jeremy mentioned, when, uh, while we were still working for the national, uh, national governments uh, in the US and Slovakia, respectively, uh, we're being approached by, by uh, governments from all over the world. We spoke with, with Canada, Germany, and, and a number of others, uh, some of whom were part of uh, uh, OGP at the national level, some of, some of who were not. Uh, and they said, if there's something happening uh, within education, it's almost almost never uh, at the at the national level in uh, in uh, our country. It's at the level of provinces. It's at the level of like local uh, local governments. It's uh, you know they do not like you know the federal government to 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 say what's uh, or dictate what the what the uh, local policy should be or educational policy should be. They want it as decentralized as as possible. So there's many ways to get involved. Uh, uh, so just to make clear, what we'll be discussing is. Uh, yes, how the, how the OGP works formally and how you can get involved formally. Yes, what resources you can use if your city is already part uh, of, of, of OGP or if your country is part of OGP. Uh, but even if, if it is not uh, or not yet, uh, you know, there's still a lot to, uh, to take away from here and, and a lot of these principles uh, apply nevertheless. I think that's, that's such a good point. I think the, yeah, the spirit of this kind of collaborative partnership is something that we can all implement at a local level in, in our various capacities. And I see Beat has a question about this. Um, I'm a K-12 educator, or I'm in the K-12 education sector in Uganda. How would OGP be useful to me? And how could I go about doing implementation with the local city? So that, uh, that ties into yeah what, what Jan's saying. I just checked and Uganda is not on the OGP local. Um, list of 56 new countries, but I, I need to double check and see if Uganda is part of the OGP national um, level. We, we can definitely, in the second part of this, this session, talk a little bit more or brainstorm with you a little bit more about um, what we might be able to do and how we might be able to connect you to other OGP representatives or um, community members that have done work in neighboring countries if Uganda is not a part. Of the OGP, I just um, before we before we move on, I, I also wanted to just echo what Jan was saying that it even if you're not a part of the OGP at the national or local level, your work is still so essential. I was thinking back about um, when I was working at the State Department and very clueless about open education in general, and just learning about it as as someone who was like, oh, this sounds interesting, but with no context. And I needed, I needed, needed all of the, the insight and momentum that had already been built by um, not just folks in the US, but in other countries as well. I needed to draw from that and learn as much as I could and also be able to rely on civil society members from Spark, from Creative Commons and from a number of other organizations so that the, the input that um, they provided could be best used in the ultimately in the um, commitments that we made to the open government partnership and then we're able to enact so without that that initial kind of momentum and work at the local level we would have never been effective at the policy level and it's I mean it's I can't um, I can't thank folks like Nicole Allen and and others enough for that kind of direct support that was provided. That was because of years of work prior to our engagement. So the policy- I'd love to comment, comment on that too and share an experience as well. Um, I worked at the US Department of Education leading Go Open, um, which was all about supporting K-12 OER. And we could not do it without those civil societies and local organizations. Um, you know, it was, we relied heavily on them and even when, um, so back to Jan's point about like implementing all the things without being official. <laughs> um, when we brought on Go Open States, which were states 
departments of education at the state level um, that were committed to, you know, making inroads for open education in their respective states. They committed to joining a community of practice, letting people know, kind of building awareness of OER, um, creating a repository to be able to find the resources. And we started with 14 states in my, like when I first joined in my year fellowship, by the end we had 20, which was great considering we had grown, um, but there were at least, uh, I would say seven, eight to 10 states that were doing all of the things but couldn't officially join because they might have been um, states that had representatives that were different than the political party that was in charge at the time. You know, so it was very political where they couldn't, you know, put out the press release that say, we're joining this national initiative because of politics. And so they were doing the work. And I think that it is, it's very, um, it's very doable to do the work without being like the official. And um, I've seen it in action. And so it, some of my colleagues at New America afterwards came from the US Digital Services, which were um, folks, technologists that they brought into the US government to work at different agencies um, to help solve large technical issues. And they worked on um, crime data and things like that. And they had to rely on the local municipalities to share their open data. And so again, it's back to that local connection, uh, but it, it starts with trust and building up that trust and really building up the background as far as what Jenrin is saying around understanding the context of everything and then developing that relationship. And we know that relationships matter in so much of the work that we do. Um, and so it really starts with the relationships, getting that trust and then being able to move things forward. Yep. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you are our moderator for this. I feel like you're <laughs> Drawing from your expertise in this brainstorming session way more than you anticipated. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there's there's one one more thing that uh, that just reiterates what you what you, what you just said. Um, right now, uh, yes, there are 56 new uh, new members of OGP Local, uh, but so there were several times more applicants as far as I uh, uh, as I know, and uh, when when someone is is, is about to join the OGP. Uh, you know, they are being evaluated. Um, OGP is not supposed to be a formal organization or someone puts it on their CV or their city CV. Yes, we are members of this exclusive club and look how cool we are. Uh, what they actually look at is, is, is what's really happening on the ground. You know, uh, is, there, is, there, is there life? Is there something really uh, going on already? Uh, OGP already had members who uh, formally joined but uh, were not really active. There was one member uh, who was part of OGP and uh, that is not the case any longer. Um, we can talk about even you know, complicated situations like that in the discussion when the recording is over. <laughs> There's a reason why that is happening. Uh, why, why we, we will turn it off so that we have a safe, safe space to, to discuss things. And um, so yeah, uh, there's activity, uh, there's supposed to be activity uh, uh, happening and uh, it's not just you apply and you are automatically in. First of all, there's, uh, there's criteria for, uh, for, for joining the OGP. They look at things like, does this country um, uh, have a Freedom of Information Act? Uh, what is the position and, uh, and situation where civil societies are? Uh, do they have a voice? Uh, can they function uh, you know, in, in, in a reasonable manner? Things like that. So there's a checklist of things that the country uh, or, the or that need to be met at the national level uh, before the application is even considered. Um, and for OGP local, uh, if you want to apply, your country already needs to be a member of, uh, uh, as a national government, they already need to be a member of OGP before they even consider the application of, 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 of the local country. And, they, and they've been also doing some, some uh, pretty uh, heavy vetting of, 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 of who's about to join. So this is not just like an exclusive club, but just like you said, you know, things need to be happening already. So uh, even again, uh, even if, if you are not, uh, or, or a city is not part of OGP, it's, th there's no reason why not to do things the OGP way already. Uh, which I think, you know, we can, we can slowly transition to, uh, to, to the part where we interact a little more. Uh, but before we do, uh, uh, let, me, let me just point out that uh, if, uh, if, if there's someone uh, watching this who, is not, who was not able to attend live, uh, there is, uh, just like for every uh, OB Global session, there is a page on, on, the, on the OE Global Connect uh, forum. 
connect.oeglobal.org. So if you go there and, and look, this, look up the session, you will see all the resources uh, related to the session. We'll, we will post it when um, uh, during this workshop and also some content when the workshop is over. If there's a question you would like to ask, uh, if you would like to get in touch with, with Jenrin or I, uh, that's a good way to, uh, to, to go to the forum and, and, uh, and, and stay in touch. So I think this could be a good time to, uh, to uh, turn up the recording now <laughs> and, uh, and uh, move on to...